did get this far in the early service before we had to call the fire department. And I held this up. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I was not sure. The children that were there did not know, I don't think, exactly what this was. Does anybody know what this is? Beats. Beats. Yeah, these are beats. And after I had most of the sermon written and had thought about it, I, I thought, well, something happened that changed my mind. And really, the sermon title should be Just Eat the Beats. Now, here's my question to you. Do you like beets? Yeah. Can I see a show of hands? Do you like beets? Wow, this is a beet eating community. I like that one. Yeah. Um, well, I have to tell you that when I was in my early 20s, my mother decided that she was going to grow a lot of beets. I mean, a lot of beets. I don't know if um, she heard about how good they were for you or she'd gotten a special on, um, is it seeds that you plant to plant, plant beets or is it like potatoes? That I don't even know. But anyway, she planted beets and she was going to use them no matter what. In any case, it turned out that the very first meal that my boyfriend, now my husband, sitting on the front row, the first meal that he had with our family, she had run out of things to do with beets. She put them in casseroles, and she had pickled them, and she had, had tried to slip them in meatloaf, and she decided to try something new. And what she tried, she decided to make a salad dressing out of beets and probably mayonnaise or sour cream. Anyway, I want you to picture in your mind taking a bottle of Pepto-Bismol and pouring it on some nice leafy greens. You got that image? Because that's what it looked like. Okay. And my boyfriend, now husband, was the only one at that table who was able to say something even slightly positive. And he said, well, Mrs. Rutledge, uh, this certainly is mm, unique. <laughs> that's, that's all we could come up with. But I tell you what, for me, from that time on, and and, and maybe since then too, um, I had the opinion that beets, um, they may be pretty to look at, pretty color, but they taste, well, kind of like dirt. Yeah. Okay? That was until I had a beet epiphany. That's right, a beet epiphany. And it wasn't once, but it was twice in this last few months. You see, I went on a field trip with my son's band and, and chorus group to Amish country, and we got to go to a Mennonite family farm, and there we had this wonderful meal, and the food was just delicious. In fact, it was so good, I had to try everything, including the pickled beets. And I have to say, they tasted a lot less like dirt than I remembered. But then, just this week, I was over at a friend's house, and she made this wonderful uh, smoked pork loin on the grill, and she had a side of grilled beets. And let me tell you, I like them so much, I went back for seconds. And as I was preparing this sermon, I thought, that that's really should be the name of the sermon, to just eat the beets. You see, these words are meaningful to me in light of the scripture that we read today. And the words were in there that said, whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, eating and drinking whatever they provide. Now, what does this really mean for us in this culture? And what did it really mean to the disciples? You see, from Luke 10, we get a very different way of looking at hospitality. Hospitality is, is not just about giving, but it's also in the receiving. Now to illustrate what I'm talking about, I want to tell you a lesson that I've learned about relying on others and relying on God to supply what we need. You see, when my children were just little, preschool and elementary age, I was a stay-at-home mom. I simply could not go back to teaching school when my oldest was born in June and come August I had decided that I would stay at home and then the second one came along. Now if you had told me when I was a teenager or, or even a young adult that I would make a decision to do something like that I would have really scoffed at the idea. But my intuition and the opportunity kind of converged and we were able to make it financially so that I spent those years focusing on raising those boys, those two boys. 
Now, along the way, I did serve as the contractor for the house that we built, and I volunteered at the church an awful lot. In fact, that was my entry into ministry, was being a volunteer at the church all the time. Now, I wrote these words about being a contractor and volunteering, and then I looked back, and it kind of amuses me that then and now, I feel like I have to, to quantify that I did something else, not just raising my kids, but that'll be a sermon for another day. I guess that the, the circumstances that formed the main reason that, that I was at home made me reluctant when I needed to ask someone to watch my children for me. I, I didn't even want to ask their grandparents who lived nearby. You see, I identified myself first and foremost as a mom. The idea of giving up that role, even for a few hours, it, it was unthinkable. And I couldn't bear the idea of being a burden to others. So I rarely if ever asked. You know, as a couple, my husband and I aligned ourselves with a group of friends where it was okay to bring our kids along. And that's what we did. But knowing that our marriage needed nurturing as much as our children, there did come some occasions when we needed to be just adults or just by ourselves. And so I occasionally did make a phone call. I didn't have babysitters that I could pay, and really, I, the idea of paying someone to do my job was, was kind of difficult for me, and we had a limited amount of income. So I would work up my nerve, and I would go call, find a, a friend that I could call, and ask if my children could come visit for a few hours, or when they were a little bit older, even overnight. Now, I can still feel how anxious that made me feel. It kind of bubbled up in my gut. And I was thinking about who might be willing to have them over for a few hours. And it makes my pulse quicken even now when I think about it. Well, you know, it's not the only time that I have felt vulnerable and needy, but it still stands out in my mind as one of the most physically and emotionally exhausting experiences I've ever had. And my kids are, are 17 and 20 now, so it's been a while. I wonder this morning if any of you have ever had a situation where you really needed help. I mean, you must have help, but you found it hard to ask. Think about situations for a minute when you've needed to rely on the help of family or friends, or even worse, on people that you don't know. Now, it could be a medical emergency or a financial crisis. And it could be that maybe you were just lonely and you really needed a friend or someone to be with you and you might have been a little hesitant to ask. For me, this anxiety came as I picked up the phone to call and I realized that I was giving that person kind of power over my life. You see, they could say yes or they could say no. I mean, even if they were able to watch my children for me, they could still say no. But often, when I got the answer, and it was so rare that I asked that it was almost always a yes that I got, that when the person actually said yes, I'd have to get off the phone very quickly before I burst into tears of relief. You know what happened to me time and again when I had to reach out for help in this and other situations? I was humbled by the gift that others were able to give me. And it made, me, it made me open my eyes to see needs of people around me when they were in need, not just of babysitting or other things. It, it helped transform how I looked at the world. In our scripture this morning, we have a very, very different kind of great commission. Many of you may be familiar with the passage from Matthew 28 that says, Go, make disciples of all nations. But this text is very, very different. It's a different kind of sending out. In Luke 10, Jesus specifically sends the sending out, and he asks them to be vulnerable. He says, go without purse, go without resources, accept the hospitality of whoever welcomes you. Would I, would you be able to do that today if we were asked? Or would we set out on a mission trip with a debit card, a credit card, 
suitcases, a tank full of gas, maybe a cooler packed with drinks. It'd be hard, wouldn't it, to go out in territory unknown with no resources and completely depend <coughs> upon the kindness of strangers for a place to stay, for food, and for drink. It makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it, to be that vulnerable. A few years ago, this was at least 15 years ago, I was in a, an adult Bible study class that was a gifts assessment. Maybe you've done that here or been part of something like that. Where we did a questionnaire, we, we answered a lot of questions about our activities and our interests. And I found out that there was a gift of hospitality and that I had that gift. Now, I didn't even know that that was a gift. But it was really life affirming to know that something that I enjoyed doing and was good at doing was something that, that was a gift given from God and, and I could use it to His glory. But it was really not until looking at the scripture this morning and preparing that I started thinking about hospitality in reverse. The gift of accepting hospitality. You know, the church and I mean mainline denominations, particularly in North America, Methodists and Lutherans and Presbyterians and Episcopals and Baptists and even the Catholic Church, we have been trying, it seems to me, for at least 25 years to learn about hospitality, about, about welcoming people in, and about cultivating <coughs> diversity and trying to get people to come to our church who, who may live in a different part of town or have a different background than us. We've really been working very hard at it. And I'm, I'm, I guess, guilty of that myself because I have read lots and lots of books and articles about being a hospitable, welcoming church. I've taught adult Sunday school classes and, and started hospitality ministries at churches. And I've also, even a few years ago, I did a little sermon starter skit where I was serving to talk about how we, we do church speak. We, we use a language that's not familiar, and we need to be aware of that, that. Sometimes it's hard for people to come into our midst and understand words like vestibule and doxology and atonement. And, it, and it's true. We do need to be, be aware that even if it's printed in our bulletin, um, the visitor, the potential new member, may not understand the code. But you know, never once did it occur to me that we, that I was saying, yes, please come in, join us, speak like us, make yourself fit in, adapt yourself to who we are. And never once did it occur to me that going out to where they were and being willing to be the other in their midst might be something that God was calling me, calling us to do. You now the language that Jesus uses in this passage is pretty clear. Go out there, two by two, and where you are welcomed, live among those who offer you hospitality. Where you are not welcomed, well, it's not for you to judge. It is for you to offer peace when it is not accepted. You shake the dust off your feet and move on. See, we are to make way for the transformational love of God to work, but we are not called to force that transformation. That's God's work. Our work is to be open to the other, to not change the other into someone that looks and speaks like us, or to even assist that they become like us and worship like us. It's a really hard lesson for me. I don't know about you. Uh, a man who wrote a book called Translating the Message, his name is Laman Sama. He talks about this phenomena in the church in Africa that, that kind of illustrates where I'm going with this point. You see, in Africa, when the church was associated with colonization, they, they got so far in church growth and then it stagnated. But when colonialization, when that era was over and, and the church was translated into the language of the people that lived there, then, then the language of the, the colonizers was gone and it was the language of the, the people there. And the church growth 
just exploded. It's all about context. It's all about letting people worship God in, in their way, in their context. So we, we are not called to homogenize or convert, to, but we're called to bring that kingdom of God near to people and, and be a vehicle so that they can understand that God's kingdom is all about love. Ours is to even accept the hospitality that's offered to us, to just eat the beets. Jesus tells the 70 to take nothing with them, no purse, no coin. What might it look like if we, as a church, embraced the possibility of allowing ourselves to accept hospitality from those who may look, speak, and live differently than us? It might mean going into very unfamiliar territory. It might be being vulnerable the same way that Jesus, the Messiah, lived out his mission, his ministry, and vulnerability. Missions then become less about swooping in and presenting a wonderful VBS or bringing God to the community and more about recognizing that God is already there. When we understand we are not bringing God to the community and we're finding God when we arrive, then the transformation that happens, well, guess what? It happens to us. This kind of reverse hospitality will change you. Reverse hospitality often happens to people when they go on mission trips. This is a very active church, and I can tell by some of the things that you do, you've been out on missions. And you may go to build a school, or to teach children about God, or to re rebuild after a natural disaster. But then when you are received, and housed, and fed, and welcomed into the community, you often find that you're the one that's changed. Amen? Dr. Elaine Heath, who came to conference this past year, she wrote a book called Longing for Spring. And in that book she says that the neighborhood, not the big brick building with the cross and flame, is where the Christians are sent to be the church. The neighborhood is my parish, whether my neighbors become Methodist or not. What matters is that they experience the kingdom of God coming near and that they know it is a kingdom of love. The picture of how we do that can be as diverse as the people that we are called to serve. Perhaps it's ministry in an ethnic community different from our own, or it could be to be a volunteer at an elementary school, or to be the once a week or once a month lunch buddy <coughs> for someone who is confined to home or lives in a nursing facility. Perhaps we're called to work side by side in the neighborhood garden or the soup kitchen or the homeless shelter. And perhaps your ministry will be to serve people on the margins of society, people who are in prison or their loved ones who have folks in prison, people with disabilities or people who are rebuilding their lives, whether it is from recovery from addictions or whether it's from natural disasters that happen. You know, Jesus practiced intentional poverty and dependence on others for hospitality. That's a pretty good model to follow, isn't it? So did John Wesley. It's reputed that Wesley once said, when I have money, I get rid of it quickly, lest it find a way into my heart. And some of you may have read some books by Henry Nowen. He was a, a Catholic priest and author. And he writes books, he wrote books on spiritual disciplines. And he described the church as a mosaic of, of like individual stones that vary in color and beauty. Some are plain and some are sparkling. And when you look at them individually, these stones, we do compare them based on how pretty they are or, or their value. But when you put them together, they form a mosaic, a complete picture. And he says this, he says, that's community. A fellowship of little people who together make God visible in the world. The good news is that we share 
and, and it's the reign of God that has come near. And we can feel the authority that's given to us by the generosity of those we come to serve. If we humbly allow ourselves in true openness to minister to others, to go into their spaces and to maybe eat their food, to learn their customs, to allow God to be translated in a way that may be different from our own tradition, but true to the mission that God requires of us all. You know, in our scripture this morning, it might seem that the biggest gift offered to the 70 was, was the ability to, to tread on scorpions or cast out demons. But perhaps the biggest gift offered is to trust enough in God to rely on those around us, to rest in the mercy of the people that God places in our path, to just eat the beets. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.